started again. So our next presenters are Matt Siegel and Becca Tarnas. And Matthew David Siegel is a doctoral student in PCC. His dissertation is tentatively titled The Cosmotheandric Imagination in Whitehead, Steiner, Coleridge, and Shelley. He will explore the role of imagination in the scientific and religious cosmologies of these thinkers in order to shed more light on the genius at work beneath ordinary human consciousness. The guiding question of his research is, what must human consciousness be such that insight into nature of the wisdom, sorry, let me say this again. The guiding question of your research is, what must human consciousness be such that insight into the nature of the universe is possible? And Becca Tarnas is an artist, writer, and master's student in PCC. She has a BA in environmental studies and theater arts from Mount Holyoke College, and her foundational schooling was through Rudolf Steiner's Waldorf education. She is deeply passionate about caring for the earth and finding ways through art and storytelling to help humanity continue to fall in love with our exquisite planet. And so today, Matt and Becca are going to be speaking about this topic, from Mother Earth to Lover Earth. So let's welcome Matt and Becca. Chaos was first of all. But next appeared broad-bosomed earth, sure standing place for all the gods who live on snowy Olympus peak, and misty Tartarus in a recess of broad-pathed earth, and love most beautiful of all the deathless gods. Earth bore starry heaven, first to be an equal to herself, to cover her all over, and to be a resting place, always secure for all the blessed gods. Then she brought forth long hills, the lovely homes of goddesses, the nymphs who live among the mountain clefts. Then, without pleasant love, she bore the barren sea with its swollen waves, Pontus. And then she lay with heaven and bore deep whirling Oceanus and Chios, then lovely Tethys and Phoebe, golden crowned. Last, after these, most terrible of sons, the crooked scheming Kronos came to birth, who was his father's vigorous enemy. O goddess, source of gods and mortals, all fertile, all destroying Gaia, mother of all who brings forth the bounteous fruits and flowers, all variety, maiden who anchors the eternal world in our own, immortal, blessed, crowned with every grace, deep-bosomed earth, sweet plains and fields, fragrant grasses and the nurturing rains. Around you fly the beauteous stars, eternal and divine. Come, blessed goddess, and hear the prayers of your children, and make the increase of the fruits and grains your constant care, with the fertile seasons your handmaidens. Draw near and bless your supplicants. So the first of those was Hesiod's Theogony, and the second was an Orphic hymn to Gaia. And the primal peoples of our world saw the earth as their mother, as the all-nurturing, all-giving mother. And in many ways, this mirrors when the young child beholds their mother. The mother is like, like a goddess, completely giving, nurturing, and in con complete control of their world. So to continue the analogy um, of um, the primal uh, age of our species and the relationship of a child to the mother. Um, and analogy as well for the ancient people was um, not just a kind of poetic flourish, but um, a way of knowing. It had a, a deep epistemological significance. So the relationship between um, a mother and a child we can understand um, using scientific theory um, uh, and developmental psychology to recognize the way in which the child first begins at one with the mother. And through the process of birth, there is a trauma both for the mother and for the child that differentiates them physically. 
Um, the child is still dependent physically upon the mother, of course, um, and certainly psychologically dependent upon the mother. And it is through the mother's mirroring of the child that the child learns to take on their own identity, that the child discovers how to be a person, and eventually discovers uh, how to be autonomous, how to act in the world uh, freely, and indeed, how to love. But as the child grows into adolescence, there is usually a period of, of rebellion, um, of a need to take the differentiation to such an extreme that um, sometimes the, the, the ego can become so um, um, inflated, it becomes possessed by this, this will to power. Um, and it's as if the, the mother or the parents uh, no less than nothing, and that the child, the now adolescent child, is going to discover the world for themselves. Um, and shifting to the relationship between our species and Gaia, Mother Earth, um, I think it's apparent that the last few hundred years, modernity and um, the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution, that we're kind of um, experiencing this differentiation to such an extent that it's become a dissociation and we have lost sight of and become alienated from the embrace of the mother of Mother Earth of Gaia and um, I think of, of the space program as perhaps the um, apogee or the, the best example of how this um, alienated, autonomous, powerful, egoic consciousness has um, discovered the technologies to uh, leave the Earth's gravitational embrace. And it's ironic that at this, within you know, NASA and the various space programs of the nations of the world, that at the moment of the height of our alienation, we were able to discover, in some sense, a new relationship to the Earth. Um, James Lovelock, the um, creator of the Gaia theory, points out that what's really important about the space program is not the various gadgets and technologies that it has provided. It's not the nonstick frying pans or the perfect ball bearings or Velcro or any of these bells and whistles, but it's the fact that the space program <coughs> allowed us to see the Earth from the outside for the first time. And in that process of seeing our home, seeing our mother, the mother was transformed into a lover. Um, and Becca will read for us um, a quote, not from an astronaut, but a beautiful quote nonetheless from Charles Lindbergh's uh, wife, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. She said, no one, it has been said, will ever look at the moon in the same way again. More significant, significantly can one say that no one will ever look at the earth in the same way. Humanity has freed itself from earth to perceive both its diminutive place in a solar system and its inestimable value as a life-fostering planet. As earth people, we may have taken another step into adulthood. We can see our planet earth with detachment, with tenderness, with some shame and pity, but at last, also with love. Another uh, irony about the space program is that it was in that context um, that James Lovelock, um, trying to discover an experiment to um, can be carried by one of the Viking spacecrafts to Mars to find life there. And he realized that we don't even need to go. We could just look at the chemical um, signature of the atmosphere that we can detect from the light that it gives that we can receive on Earth to see if the atmosphere is in chemical equilibrium or not. If it's in equilibrium, there's no life processes to keep the atmosphere far from equilibrium as it is on Earth. And then he, dis he realized that, well, this means that the whole Earth must be um, a, living, a living thing. Um, so it, it took this um, industrial technology of the space program to rediscover a way of um, being with the earth, now not as mother, perhaps, but as lover. So what does this 
new form of relationship, this loving relationship with the earth look like? In many ways, the beginning of the environmental movement, even before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, can be seen as the conservation movement that was started uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and led by um, the president at the time was Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and then of course John Muir. Uh, we have Muir Woods here in honor of him. And the conservation movement, it had a few sides to it. For Gifford Pinchot, the conservation movement was more about conserving nature for future generations, for future use of resources. And then for someone like uh, John Muir, he emphasized the importance of the wilderness for its inherent value, for its inherent beauty, for it as a temple of God. Um, and he, it's because of this movement that we have the national parks and there are places set aside, at least in North America, that have been preserved. Um, but there's something about this idea of preservation, while it is so important, that doesn't capture everything that we need right now in a loving relationship with the earth. There's something about the idea of preserving a part of the earth in a pristine state that isn't realistic. It's like um, the courtly love or the chivalry troubadours of uh, the medieval era of worshiping beautiful women in this kind of virginal state, putting them on a pedestal encased in glass, never to be touched, just to be appreciated for their beauty. And while that's important, it romanticizes nature in a way that isn't realistic, that doesn't engage in the work that we have to be doing. Um, I will tell a brief story about uh, the conservation movement that led to a split between John Muir and Gifford Pinchot, actually. And uh, this is around the Hetch Hetchy Valley. Uh, Yosemite Valley, which I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of, is incredibly beautiful. And right next to it was the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which, as John Muir said, was equally beautiful. <coughs> and they, after the 1906 earthquake and fire in San Francisco, there was a need for more water in San Francisco. And so they decided to dam the Hetch Hetchy Valley. Uh, and this really, this just seemed like such an affront to John Muir. Um, so this is a quote from John Muir about, uh, about that. All nature's wildness tells the same story. The shocks and outbursts of earthquakes, volcanoes, geysers, roaring, thundering waves and floods, the silent uproot of sap and plants, storms of every sort, each and all, are the orderly, beauty-making love beats of nature's heart. Do you want to read the second one? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, just that quote sort of speaks to the way that while the conservation movement perhaps um, put nature in a glass case and, and romanticized it as something that would remain as it is in a sort of static, picturesque way, mm -hmm. that Muir um, had a more complex vision of nature that was um, in dynamic <coughs> process, that, it, that there were catastrophes, um, and that in some ways we need to engage in, in that dance of creative destruction in order to bring forth resilient communities of life. Um, the proper quote that I should have read, however, uh, <laughs> is this one. These temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have a perfect contempt for nature, and instead of lifting their eyes to the gods of the mountains, lift them to the almighty dollar. Damn, Hetch Hetchy, that's D-A-M. As well as damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. So while the, the idea of preservation has great value, we have to do something more. There has to be a consummated marriage loving relationship between humanity and the earth, especially in places where we have caused so much damage, where the rape of the earth has been so devastating. And 
what does that look like? Yesterday, we had so many beautiful definitions of what love is. One that Rand said is, love is seeking the full flourishing and highest potential of the beloved. Robert said, love is the free giving of one to the other. An example of how humanity can do this with the earth, an example that's really close to my heart is Rudolf Steiner's biodynamic farming, which engages fully with the earth, not only in a way that doesn't cause damage, but actually gives back more. So the idea of biodynamic preparations, it's like a homeopathic healing of the earth, giving back even more than we're taking. Um, another example, soil erosion is such a devastating issue with agriculture all around the world. And there are different methods that are being tried out on different farms of grass farming where um, there are different ways to rotate uh, the animals over the land that can actually rebuild the topsoil four times faster than if the land was left fallow. So yes, the earth can heal if we leave it alone, but the earth can heal four times faster if we engage with her and we put ourselves into this healing, loving relationship. There are other projects happening, like the Peace Pagoda Project, which is building these pagodas that act as uh, like acupuncture needles at places on the earth. So in this analogy of humanity as the child to the mother, and now possibly moving to the lover of the earth, we have to realize, of course, we are still dependent on the earth, but we're no longer powerless. And as we have become powerful, we now hold a greater responsibility because not only is our future dependent on the earth, but now the earth's future is dependent on us. So as the earth is bringing about our full flourishing and the highest potential, by meeting that highest potential, we can bring about the earth's full flourishing and highest potential as well. So a question um, that we might leave you with is if we were to go back in time um, to the beginning of the 20th century and have the opportunity to uh, approach the human need for more water in San Francisco and approach um, the community of, of life's needs uh, around the Hetch Hetchy Valley, how would uh, a humanity willing to engage the earth as a partner uh, have solved this problem? Um, John Muir speaks of nature as a temple. And you know, I offer perhaps one way of, of beginning to think about how we might engage nature as lover um, by, you know, perhaps there is a way in which human beings can, can harness the tremendous power um, of water uh, in order to provide for our way of life. But we have to be in dialogue with the creatures, with the rivers and the trees and the mountains of the place um, to treat uh, this energy that we can harness as a gift, not something that we should expect. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of just sending engineers and architects to measure the dimensions of this valley, um, we could send you know, healers, um, spiritual leaders, um, poets, artists, biologists, um, to engage with the place as a living place with its own um, needs and desires and um, in some ways to ask the place, how can we make you more beautiful and how can we make our own way of life, uh, allow our own way of life to flourish? How can we do this together? How can we create, um, you know, what I'll still have to call a dam, but what is also uh, a temple which, which celebrates the place. It isn't just exploiting it for profit. How can we make the place more beautiful while at the same time solving the real human need of a large city like San Francisco. So, something to think about. Thank you. We have time for a couple questions, so. A minute or two? Uh, just, just one, po another point to bring up in terms of the, in terms of the pristine preservation. Taking Yosemite as, as a model, it's also a very pristine 
what's being thought of as to preserve is also a very specific moment in history mm -hmm. when, there are, when there's no human habitation, right. when all the Native Americans who lived there have been expelled or killed mm -hmm. so that what was real before, you know, it wouldn't look the way it, the way it looks in the Ansel Adams photographs. There'd be smoke from cooking fires. There'd be also, you know, right. so that's, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, just the, the idea of, of wilderness as though it were not cultivated yeah. by native peoples is kind of a romanticized <coughs> idea that human beings have been living with the land of North America for many, many, many thousands of years. But they preserved it in a way that they were still able to engage with it. You know, there was there was a participatory relationship rather than this sort of um, withdrawn uh, preservation approach. What what is the land that's made up of the species that interact with it? And recognizing that you can't preserve it in a static state. Mm -hmm. Michelle. Oh, um, I can't help but make the connection to the body in that way, mm -hmm. too, and how, um, whether it's the puritanical lineage or if it has something to do with wanting to not age and be perfect forever, and then sort of that, that you know, maintaining of, of youth and beauty in, in some form. But those are also wounds, I think, that we're trying to work with or trying to reframe now. And so I think it's, it's related all, on all of the levels, yeah. you know, to what we're working on. Thank so. you for extending the metaphor even further. Yeah. I was just thinking about how some people would want to bring in, in into an economic situation where it's profitable to to return the land to a certain state or mm -hmm. maybe someone starting an earth acupuncture company, you know, on Kickstarter and so I'm just trying to think about how in the in the, in American uh, cultural context uh, you know, how does that look? Well, I mean part of the problem I think is um, the economic, the economic sphere has swallowed all the other spheres, um, and that everything is interpreted in terms of its its dollar value instead of its um, life value, its aesthetic value, its cultural value, its spiritual value, its biological value. I mean, so there are other value spheres that I think need to be um, brought into consideration, so that uh, the economy isn't the only um, sphere of human life that we're trying to view this problem through. The almighty dollar, as John Muir yeah. said in the quote. Yeah. So that's become our temple in many ways, and we have to break out to the larger sphere. Thanks so much. Thank you.